The first word from Luke 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let me lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, help us now to understand your word, that we may know why Jesus died and receive the forgiveness he offers. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, offering forgiveness is one of the greatest acts of love. And the greater the evil to be forgiven, the greater the love. Uh, during World War II, Corrie ten Boom was arrested for hiding Dutch Jews from the Nazis. She was caught and placed in a concentration camp in Ravensbrück, along with her sister Betty, Betsy. Together they witnessed unspeakable evils. Corrie survived the ordeal, Betsy did not. Corey went on to write, of course, that best-selling book, The Hiding Place, and for more than three decades went around the world teaching others how they may know God's forgiveness and then offer it to others. And one fateful day in 1947, as she was sharing in a Munich church, her conviction of those truths was put to the test. A balding man in, in a grey overcoat stepped forward after the service to meet her. She froze. She knew this man very well. He'd been one of the vicious guards at Ravensbrook who had mocked the women prisoners as they showered. He held out his hand towards her and he said, how good it is to know all of our sins are at the bottom of the sea. He continued, I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did there at Ravensbrook, but I'd like to hear it from your lips as well. Will you forgive me? For a moment, she struggled to do what she knew she must. If God had forgiven her all her sins, how could she not forgive this man? She prayed. She thrust out her arm into his, and with tears from her eyes, she said, I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. Now, offering forgiveness is one of the greatest acts of love. And in that moment, she did it. But for the next few minutes, I want us to consider an even greater offer of forgiveness offered to each one of us by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, during the service, we'll be considering seven sayings that Jesus said from the cross that give us insight into his death. And the first one, uh, in Luke's gospel, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Uh, to grasp the profound love of Christ that shines forth in that statement, we'll consider it in its context. And first we need to understand that Jesus is dying unjustly for our sins. Jesus is dying unjustly for our sins. Uh, verse 32, Luke 23, two, other criminals, uh, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Now notice here there is no gory details about nails going through his hands, no discussion of his pain and agony, no hint of blood and so on. Uh, what movies like The Passion of the Christ dwell on, Luke doesn't even mention. He just says they crucified him. But what he does want us to look at is the real significance of his death. And that's why he emphasizes that Jesus is executed in the middle of these two criminals. The other gospels make it clear they were violent murderers. But Jesus himself is innocent. Six times in Luke 23, Luke mentions that Jesus is innocent. I find no guilt in this man. I find no basis for your charges against him. He has done nothing to deserve death. I found in him no grounds for the death penalty. This man has done nothing wrong. Surely this was a righteous man. Jesus is dying unjustly for our sins. Jesus, who only ever loved others and did good, brutally executed as a criminal. Why? 
Well, before his death, Jesus spoke these words in Luke 22. I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. He was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. Jesus is quoting here from Isaiah 53, which we read at the beginning of the service. In that same chapter, we read this. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, Jesus is not dying as punishment for his own sins. He is being punished unjustly for ours. The Bible says that we have all rejected God's rightful rule, perhaps ignoring him or maybe worshipping other gods. We disobey his commands so that we can live our own way. We live for comfort and honour, uh, for our own benefit. We pursue greed and lies and pride to achieve it. We're sinners. We deserve God's punishment. We deserve to die. But if you like, on that cross, Jesus took that full record of our sins in our place. Jesus, the innocent one, swapped places with us. He took our sins. He took our punishment the righteous for the unrighteous. He was punished so that we could go free. He died so that we could be forgiven. Jesus is dying unjustly for our sins. And that's the second point, brings us to the second point. Jesus is dying that we might be saved. Jesus is dying that we might be saved. Uh, verses 34 to 39 are then filled with this incredible irony because throughout those verses, Jesus is mocked as a crucified king who can't save, and yet even as he's mocked, everything that is said of him is actually true. So firstly, verse 35, the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, his chosen. The Jewish leaders are there mocking Jesus. Oh, here's the one who claimed to be the saviour, who healed the sick and raised the dead and drove out demons. He can't even save himself. How pathetic. And then they're joined by the soldiers, verse 36. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Jesus is condemned for being the Christ, a rival king to Caesar but they don't see any glorious Messiah king who's going to rule over the nations forever. The soldiers see a weak, pitiful man hanging helpless on a cross, unable to save himself, let alone others. Pilate mocks Jesus too, verse 38. There was an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. It's placed there by Pilate to humiliate Jesus and to taunt the Jews. Pilate is saying, Look how pathetic is your crucified king. And to top it off, even one of the uh, the criminals manages to gasp out a few mocking words of his own. Verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. He thinks no king would be on that cross. If he really was the Christ, he'd save us right here and now. And as I said, the great irony of these verses is that although they're spoken to mock Jesus, everything they say about Jesus is true. Jesus is the Christ, the King of the Jews. He is chosen by God to rule over all the nations. And as he hangs there, he is saving others by not saving himself. Because as he dies, the righteous for the unrighteous, he's taking our punishment, he's taking our sin so that we can be forgiven. So Jesus is dying unjustly for our sins. Jesus is dying that we might be saved. And it's in that context that we understand this first word of the cross. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus is dying so that we can be fully forgiven. Jesus is dying so that we can be fully forgiven. Now, it might surprise us, actually, to know that those words, Father, forgive them, etc., were probably not written by Luke himself. 
You'll find a footnote in your Bible that says verse 34 is absent from the earliest manuscripts. So they were almost certainly added by a later scribe, borrowing from Stephen's words in Acts chapter 7, who thought that Jesus should be presented as more forgiving than Stephen is. So although it's quite possible that Jesus never actually spoke these words from the cross, they are nonetheless a good summary of why Jesus died. Jesus is dying so that we can be fully forgiven. It was Jesus himself who taught back in Luke 6, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing as he hangs on the cross, loving his enemies, blessing those who curse him. Whether or not Jesus spoke those exact words, Father, forgive them. It is the essence of what his death was about. That Jesus is dying unjustly for our sins. Jesus is dying to save us from God's judgment. Jesus is dying so that we can be fully forgiven. Colossians 2 says this, God has forgiven all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside nailing it to the cross. I think what uh, Corrie ten Boom did in 1947 was truly remarkable. I don't think many people could do what she did. As she looked in the eye, the man who viciously tortured her and was involved in the death of her sister, she shook his hands and declared, I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. But in fact, even that amazing act is nothing compared to what Jesus was doing as he died on the cross, as he died for the very sinners who put him there with outstretched arms, offering us full and complete forgiveness now and forever. It is the greatest act of love our world has ever seen because it is the greatest debt of sin, evil, ever forgiven. So let me ask you this morning, or this uh, this afternoon, I guess it is now, have you accepted the full forgiveness that Jesus offers? I think every one of us, if we are honest, has thought, said, and done things that we are ashamed of. We fail to love God and others. And just like Corrie ten Boom, it would have been entirely right for her to vent her anger on that guard that day in 1947. And so God has every right to vent the full extent of his anger upon us too and send us to the fires of hell. But that day, 2,000 years ago, the world witnessed that great act of love because instead of venting that punishment we deserve, he accepted it himself. He died so that we can be forgiven. Jesus' death means our Debt of sin can be cancelled. Our slate can be wiped clean. We can have a fresh start with God, forgiven fully and forever for everything we've ever thought, said and done. That is amazing. But would you this day receive this forgiveness Jesus offers by turning to him as your saviour and king? And if you have already done that, as many of us will have, will you be transformed by it? So that like Corrie ten Boom, you're able to offer forgiveness to those who have hurt you, no matter how deep the wounds, because God forgave you. That's very hard. It's the greatest act of love you can offer. But you'll be able to do it as you think on the forgiveness you've received. Offering forgiveness is the greatest act of love. The greater the evil, the greater the love. And that makes Christ's death for sinners the greatest act of love ever known. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for sending your Son that we might be forgiven. Help us to receive his forgiveness. And changed by your love, help us to offer forgiveness to others. 
In Jesus' name, amen. 